Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. We're gonna take a quick look at the term Jim Crow, its meaning, its influence, its impact on the United States of America, because you need to know whether you're a kid in school, whether you're a lifelong learner, or whether you're cray cray on the internet, understanding Jim Crow should be a requirement of citizenship. So let's talk a little bit about the origin of the word Jim Crow before we go into kind of the concept of de jure and de facto segregation. Jump Jim Crow was an old song and dance routine that originated in 1828, which was written by a white comedian by the name of T.D. Daddy Rice, who would perform in blackface, basically to make fun of slaves. Wheel about and turn about and do just so. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. The term Jim itself is short for Jim Jimmy, like I'm going to jimmy a lock, and that was a crowbar. So a crowbar in the 1800s was sometimes called a Jim or a Jimmy. And then of course crow itself was used as a term for blacks as early as the 1700s. In terms of jump Jim Crow, farmers used to feed their crows corn-soaked whiskey. Then the crows would get drunk and kind of dance around not being able to fly as the farmers, you know, kind of beat the crows to death. So there's multiple meanings behind the term Jim Crow. They all refer in a negative connotation to slaves and to freedmen, to blacks. And now we're gonna turn that term Jim Crow into a system of racial oppression. So Jim Crow laws, and that would be segregation day jury meaning that by jurisdiction, local and state ordinance, and we're also gonna talk about federal ordinances which mandate by law segregation. Now, early on, right after the Civil War, and that's where we're gonna start in 1865, we still had those Southern governments that were being controlled by kind of Confederate forces. So those Southern white Democratic dominated legislatures would pass something called black codes right after the Civil War that severely limited the rights of these new freedmen. And most of these black codes were based on vagrancy laws, where if you were black, you had to prove that you had a job and that job was recognized by whites. And if you couldn't do that, you would be forced into labor. You could be put in prison and then kind of, you know, leased out to people in order to do jobs. So many historians have called black codes slavery by another name. But that's going to change during Reconstruction because starting in 1867, the Republican-dominated Congress is going to basically mandate through the enforcement of the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment, the military occupation of the South. This is the period of history from basically 1867 to 1877, about a decade, called Reconstruction. And during Reconstruction, the black codes were eliminated. And for the most part, African Americans were allowed to vote. And you did have African Americans that were elected to high office. You had governors. Uh, there was a African American senator. There were African American state legislators. So it was kind of of working, but of course, it's all being held together by military occupation. And then there was an incident in Louisiana in 1873 called the Colfax Massacre. And this is really kind of the uh, Southern Democratic forces trying to uh, coalesce around groups in order to take back what they see as their rightful place as leaders of these Southern governments. And in Louisiana, at the Colfax Massacre in 1873, there was a group called the White League. And this White League, unlike the Klan, which was kind of a terrorist under the ground organization, the White Leagues and the Red Shirts, um, groups throughout the South, were open about their, you know, opposition to African American rights and their wanting of power. So at Colfax, this White League, League basically attacked a courthouse that was being held by Republican forces. And we basically have a mini civil war at Colfax. We ended up having about 150 African Americans that were murdered, maybe more. We're not really sure about mass graves and people that were thrown into the river and such. But that culminated in a federal trial with the conviction of some of those people who did that based on the 1870 Enforcement Act saying that you know, Congress is going to have the ability to prosecute people that are violating the rights of freedmen. In 1876, the Supreme Court comes out with a decision called United States versus Khrushchev, where they basically kind of take the teeth 
out of the Enforcement Act by saying that because this White League was not a government group but a private organization, the Enforcement Act didn't hold, that private groups could discriminate. You had to get them a different way. You probably had to use state and local courts, which weren't going to work back then. So that's kind of a breakdown of federal control over you know, the, the Southern governments and the, the rise of what's going to become Jim Crow. And then really, it all falls apart in the election of 1876. You can watch, there's a video um, on the Compromise of 1877. You can click down in the description below to watch that. But basically, there is a deal in the presidential election where the Southern Democrats kind of give their votes to the Republicans in Rutherford beat Hayes. Samuel Tilden, the Democrat, lost, even though he was from New York. That's another story. But the, the, the sticking point, the Compromise, the sellout is going to be the end of military occupation in the South by Reconstruction forces, that they're going to be able to own their governments again. And this is really the beginning of the birth of Jim Crow and Segregation Day jury down South. So let's take a look. Okay, guys, take the time. Basically, Jim Crow laws just like anybody. White people want to maintain their power at any means. When the North, when they did send down the military, the military would sit down to help give black people a sense of uh, protection, uh, a sense of uh, purpose, where they can somewhat live out their lives without being killed or lynched or anything like that. And basically what we have today, we do continue to have uh, a situation where black people are not protected, black people are not valued, uh, black people can be killed at any time. And you can tell the difference between Michael Vick went to prison for fighting guards, police officer, and I know that policing or anything in our society, there are rules, and we live in a society of rules. But we have, we have really done some things that are totally unacceptable. And history, one thing about history, it does show us as far as how Unless we are going to be committed to work together to change some things, things will be repeated, and we find ourselves in a situation where a lot of us feel that, uh, well, it's too big. This is too big. It's nothing that I can do individually. So one thing I'd like to close out, any, anybody have any questions? I, I know this is there's so much information. We don't have enough time to really dig down deep. I'm hoping that I was able to share a little information, spark your interest where you're going to go back and do some more research. I do have information up here that you can take. Those pictures on the table, do not take those. Those are mine. I do use them in classes. Don't take those. I use them in class. There's some information on the back table that I want you guys to take. But yeah, but <clears throat> I'm hoping that you guys got some information and I'm willing to step outside the comfort zone and really start challenging yourself, your family members about this, so, this thing called racism and white privilege and how we can start really working together to, to start changing some, some of the things that, uh, some of the behavior that we've been culturally conditioned to believe. We have been cultured to believe that a certain group of people are animals because that's the only reason that you can justify treating anybody as not an enemy. When you, we were brought up here, we were viewed as property. We were viewed as property. Many people today view us still as property. Many of our own people, black people, you got black people that don't want to be black. Black people, you go to South America, San Diego, Puerto Rico, black people blacker than me. They will fight you and tell you, I'm not black. I don't want to You know, they speak Spanish. They, they serious, man. They do not want to, they do not want to be black, y'all. That's real talk. And uh, go ahead, man. I'm sorry. May I ask you a question? <clears throat> I'd like to see some dialogue between the white African and the Hispanic community. I just I feel like that is another area where we people need to come together. But when I, when I worked with the Michigan Faith in Action and talked with some of our churches, no one most of our African American churches say we are so so overwhelmed with our needs and our community's needs that we we just can't mount much care or much concern 
So it's the same separate and divide as because we're that poor Hispanic and that and poor whites and poor blacks and others are in the same. So how do we bridge that that gap? Because I know we have a small Hispanic community that really keeps to itself here. They're very afraid of deportation. But, if, but to answer your question, <clears throat> most of uh, Hispanic people don't want to be classified as black. That's why, you know, in some certain applications, you got, <clears throat> I just saw this, you got, I remember, white Latino and black Latino. White Mexican and black Mexican. Who comes up with those classifications? Some real government person. But as you just said, to answer your question, then the answer is, we are going to be forced to some degree, I believe, <laughs> to start doing some things again. I think the economy, I think in the next three to five years, we're going to be forced to make some hard choices about how we can collectively come together because we can't all continue to be exploited and be continue to be raped. Yes, ma'am. When you were talking about the history that yes, people that don't know about the Southern 
Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.